he was taking the gas tank off his car. And his hot water tank in the garage, and that's apparently what started. And he attempted to put it out, I guess, and uh, he got uh, second degree burns over about 35% of his body. Okay. How serious is that? I Paramedics worked to save 37-year-old Ernest Caldwell's life as police investigators pieced together the puzzle of what had happened. Witnesses say Ernest Caldwell returned to his former house around 1.30 this afternoon. Caldwell had recently been evicted from the house. Police were tipped that a man with a gun was at the home. Two officers arrived, a brief scuffle took place. Ernest Caldwell was shot once in the chest. Marion Jackson was perched on his porch across the street when the drama unfolded. The police torched him right out there and then one night and one come up I told him to freeze. He went to sit in his car, get something. And then I heard the gunshot, and that's all I know. And then I seen the man fall outside his car. Did the man have a gun? I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell that. A police spokesman says that Caldwell was shot when he grabbed one officer and lunged for his car's glove compartment. Police say they later found a gun in the victim's glove box. Patrolman Byron Bochelle has been routinely suspended from duty until a police review board can decide whether the shooting was justified. Scott Wallace, Action 4, Northeast Oklahoma City. Hello, Jerome. Glad to see you. Yeah, glad to see you. Hello. Hello there. Glad to see you. Make a hand, Bishop. Yeah, yeah, hello. Yeah, hi there. Yeah, you good boy? You keeping it cool? For 25 years, Bishop Lewis Calvin Browning has crisscrossed the country trying to keep kids out of trouble. His Youth Crime Prevention League is a one-man war against drugs and other things which sap the strength of America's young. Education is the key to success. SIS stay in school instead of SIS stay in the streets, uh, sit in the streets. We emphasize SIS, stay in school. Become a member of the program. Uh, one finger says I'm a crime preventer. The other one says I am too. So if Bishop Browning shakes his finger at you, it doesn't mean he's angry. He just wants to know if you've joined his crusade against crime. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at the State Capitol. What's pink has 22 legs, 11 beaks, wears five and a half pair of pantyhose, and comes in two wooden crates? Answer, 11 new flamingos for the city zoo. Zoo officials have spent the last year getting the new members for their flock. They are originally from Cuba and are affectionately known as pinko flamingos. After a year in Belgium and a month in federal quarantine, the refugees were liberated this morning. Speak to me. They're in excellent condition. They're very good. You know, they're standing up immediately and walking around. And this is one of the dangers with long-legged birds. We keep them wrapped up in these pantyhose, as you see, which is really an ideal restraint. It, it stretches enough so they can flex their wings slightly and not be too stiff, but yet it keeps them from flapping and hurting themselves. Because of the heat and the questions about their political persuasions, the flamingos had to be flown in at night. The pink Cuban birds will be separated from the existing flock for about a month. Then zoo officials will introduce the two flocks and hope they have the proper mix so the flamingo family can grow on its own. But already the new birds are an object of fascination with zoo visitors. After all, how often do you get to watch a colony of refugees settling into a new home? Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the zoo. Okay. And about 30 of those were suppliers. So okay. you will see a large number of people 
the state that have some. The nature of the charges uh, that were returned by the grand jury today uh, were kickbacks and they were in the form of either mail fraud charges or extortion charges and that's the two ways in which we, we have typically charged the county commissioner cases. Uh, they received money that wasn't due they or their offices in connection with, with sales of, uh, of uh, road and bridge materials and uh, equipment and supplies. The rally involved two local anti-new groups, the community of John the 23rd and Physicians for a Social Responsibility. The latter is a relatively new organization in the area, although other parts of the nation have had Physicians for a Social Responsibility for quite some time. The keynote speaker at today's rally was Dr. Jim Lauritsen. He said the organization has met a bit of skepticism from other doctors that are not involved in the group. As one might expect, there uh, is mixed reaction. I think uh, that many physicians uh, view our group uh, perhaps as a political group, and we are not a political group. Uh, we do not take specific political stands. Uh, our thrust is education of laymen uh, and political leaders uh, to the implications of nuclear war. Physicians for Social Responsibility is a group of physicians throughout this country uh, who have become concerned about the implications of nuclear war and particularly the medical implications of nuclear war. Uh, this group has come to the conclusion that there is no medical treatment for nuclear war. The two organizations plan other anti-nuclear rallies later in the year. Kevin Ogle, Action 4. Flames could be seen ripping through the building when firemen arrived. The fire was so involved that heat became an immediate problem. The building sits on the south side of Commerce, but it was so hot, crews couldn't bear to walk on the north side of the street until it had been sprayed down. And trucks facing the flames had to be constantly hosed. Once work got underway, it was only a matter of pouring as much water on the building as possible, even though the burning structure was already a total loss. There wasn't much uh, question is whether we could put that out. So our concern was to keep the fire from spreading laterally to these adjacent businesses. So we began putting water on the fire and put people inside on either side of the fire uh, to, to keep it from spreading. And we've been successful in doing that. There's, there'll be some smoke and water damage to these adjacent buildings, but no fire damage. Damage to the Sneed Furniture Building will be extreme, but no estimate will be made until an investigation is conducted. It's believed the building had been vacant for some time but wood materials, possibly shelving, were being stored inside. The cause of the fire is unknown, but Cooksey says it's always suspicious when the building is totally involved, from front to back and first floor to third floor by the time the fire department arrives. Our firemen are already looking into the cause of this morning's fire that kept several dozen men busy for over an hour. 
Sherry Sellers, Action 4 in Southside Oklahoma City. The Schneed Furniture Company received over $400,000 in damage in last night's blaze. But more than tables and chairs were destroyed. As firefighters searched through the rubble today, they discovered that over 400,000 booklets belonging to the Anti-Crime Council as part of its efforts to fight the paramutual betting issue were also destroyed. Lee Sneed Jr., owner of the building and vice chairman of the Anti-Crime Council, was storing the booklets in the store for his organization. Ross McLennan, a top official with that organization, would not say that proponents of the group had set the fire, but he added that the betting issue had been fought harder and longer than any other issue the group had opposed. Oklahoma City Fire Department spokesman Phil Cooksey said the fire was definitely set, but the motive is still under investigation. Well, the investigators are, are confident the fire was set. Uh, we believe that early this morning, and a, a brief examination of the scene suggests that, that very likely an accelerant was used, gasoline or some other flammable liquid, most likely. Apparently, Mr. Sneed has uh, some connection with an anti-paramutual group and, and had uh, literature stored in the facility. So all sorts of things are cropping up that, uh, that may or may not have substance. Firefighters say this building is dangerous and that the remaining structure will be torn down. As for paramutual betting, the issue will be on the September 21st runoff election ballot. Kurt Autry, Action 4. Watermelon. Nothing like it on a searing summer afternoon. When it's hot outside, a little cool fruit really feels good on your insides. Employees at the Mecklenburg Duncan plant will swear to that. One afternoon every summer, workers get off to lay bare the rinds of company provided watermelon. Good stuff. Good stuff. It started years ago when the plant had to operate on the 4th of July. Employees got a watermelon break. Now it's a tradition. You want it on your lens? <laughs> sure. I bet, you can, I bet you can't hit my lens. <laughs> what do I get if I do it? There's another tradition here, too. <laughs> Spitting the seeds. <laughs> that was just practice. Now for the competition. Hey! Unfortunately, the decorum involved in spitting watermelon seeds is equaled only by the manners involved in eating the fruit. In other words, there are none. Three feet, nine and a quarter. There were winners in this contest. Ten dollars for first place, five for second. But it hardly seems worth the indignity, especially if you lost. Sharon, I thought you said you were going to win. Well, it was the wind and the conditions weren't just right. <laughs> A true professional seed spinner over here. Steve Houck, Action 4. National unemployment at the highest level since the Second World War, rosy economic reports on the Sun Belt and Oklahoma in particular are luring many people to seek jobs in the Sooner State. The New York based forecasting firm Chase Econometrics claims Oklahoma employment will grow by 8% in the next two years. 
But Will Bowman of the State Employment Commission says those figures may be misleading. Well, our projection of growth is somewhat less than uh, the Chase projection. We feel that their uh, figures probably were taken at a period of very rapid buildup in the oil and gas industry, which uh, has subsided. So I can't uh, foresee any sustained uh, growth in the employment of, of that magnitude. I do expect that there will be some growth in the employment, particularly in trade and service and, and some of the other peripheral industries. The State Employment Commission predicts job growth at an annual rate of 2.6 percent. Bowman says overall the state's economic picture is good, just not as rosy as some reports indicate. Debbie Mash, Action 4. Ronald H. Burks, a former bank director, said all board members were painfully aware of the problems that faced the Penn Square Bank, but were unaware that the bank would be declared insolvent, unaware to the extent that many of the bank's board members lost huge sums of money. Burke added that proper measures could have been taken at the last minute to save the bank. I read in the testimony that uh, before your committee that uh, it came as a surprise <laughs> during the last... Uh, week or so, uh, just two or three days before the, the bank was closed, the comptroller found out that there were 150 credit unions that had $250 million uh, in Penn Square Bank. I think the, the ramifications of the decision that the uh, comptroller of the currency uh, made, uh, I, th I think it would be very interesting to have those exposed to the light of day. Other bank directors testified today that the bank could have been saved. Mr. Stubbs, could the bank have been saved, yes or no? You, yes. Mr. Kimberly. My friend, yeah. Dr. Markle. I am not sure. I was not there at those last two meetings, and so it's hard for me to answer. Murphy. With the information I had, yes. Kurt Autry, Action 4. The determination that the loan losses were $50 million. I do know that that figure, uh, as late as two or three days before the bank closed, was uh, as low as 22, and the number was bouncing around like a ping pong ball. Mr. Kenworthy, I have no Just knowledge. Just your opinion. My, I have no opinion because I did Mr. not. Mr. Cravens, I don't have a bit of opinion. Mr. After hearing five hours of testimony from former bank officers and administrators, the banking committee focused its gun sights on federal banking regulators. The committee had heard half a dozen former Penn Square directors testify that their bank could have survived if federal officials had left them alone. Despite the criticism, those regulators who declared Penn Square insolvent stuck by their decision. I that uh, in my own personal experience, I would have to say that the Penn Square Bank, as we found it at the result of our April examination, was in the worst condition that I have ever seen a bank in my 26 years of experience as a national bank examiner and a regional administrator.
General Motors is blaming poor August sales for the extension of the layoff of more than 2,500 workers. The workers were originally laid off for two weeks to retool the plant. In other words, switch machinery to fit the 1983 cars. Officials at the plant are now saying September 20th is when GM will bring the factory workers at the first shift back. The plant had laid off 2,400 workers of the second shift in November of 81, and the prospect of bringing them back is bleak. But officials at the Oklahoma City plant feel there is a demand for the cars they manufacture. They are the smaller, compact models that are easy on gas. But the catalyst for the rejuvenation of the car sales are interest rates. We feel there's a pent-up demand for cars when the economy and the interest rates are proper. We think the sales will be there. Right now, the big cars are selling, surprisingly enough, and it's the intermediates and less that aren't selling. Nationally, GM is not faring much better than their Oklahoma City plant. Around the country, 9,100 workers have been laid off indefinitely because of poor sales. For the first 10 days of August, GM reported car sales down by 29 percent. And over the year, sales are off almost 12 percent. But Mayer believes the outlook in Oklahoma City is better than what the national figures show, and there is a chance that the Oklahoma City plant will come through the economic woes better than most. Being able to build two different models, we think our chances are better than most. Kevin Ogle, Action 4. In the A car, uh, the Celebrity and Century, Buick Century, Chevrolet Celebrity, and... We have main engine ignition, four, three, two, one, and we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. When the Columbia went into space, it opened new doors on space exploration. New experiments are conducted on board each flight to determine the effects of weightlessness on common life forms and activities, and medical advances are being made at zero gravity that weren't possible on Earth. But the Columbia and the satellites the shuttles will service help to keep an eye on the Earth, too. They have equipment sensitive enough to inventory agriculture around the world or see subtle changes in a crop and prevent losing it. As we know it today, we have to wait and see it by the naked eye. It's just like your tomato plant in your backyard. If you have uh, insect or disease in it, when you see it, it's too late because it's already damaged the tomato. So what you're looking at here is to provide that early detection to where, as a result, you could then confine it and eradicate the insect or the disease before it progresses to that point to where it would actually completely obliterate the, the crop or the fruit, whatever the case may be. The technology is there to detect the crop problems now, but getting that information out in time to save a crop is a problem itself. It's a problem space officials want to solve, because they say more agriculture dollars are lost every year to disease and insects than it costs to run the whole space program. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. While Congress did pass the Reagan-supported bill, it was close. 52 to 47 in the Senate and 226 to 207 in the House of Representatives. While the president urged all legislators to vote yes on the measure, the Oklahoma delegation wasn't listening. All six House members and both senators voted against it. After the vote, all of the Sooner lawmakers expressed disappointment that the bill had passed. Most insisted that the tax bill was the wrong solution to the nation's economic troubles. One of the most insistent was Senator David Boren. I don't think it will have much of an impact, uh, not when you're still having $450 billion in deficits and, uh, and not when you have not fundamentally changed the Federal Reserve policy and, uh, and put them back to stabilizing interest rates again. The bill will mean higher taxes on cigarettes and, and telephone service, reduce medical deductions and higher taxes on interest and dividends, also cuts in time-honored tax breaks for businesses. Although Oklahoma Congressman Jim Jones voted against the tax increase, he hailed the bill's passage as a new era of bipartisan efforts to solve the country's economic woes. But Senator Nichols downplayed the bipartisan support of liberal Democrats, saying that liberals always want tax increases. Bipartisan or not, President Reagan got his bill through, one that experts say could be politically dangerous in the long run. Kevin Ogle, Action 4.
It is a very sad day when the Oklahoma City Animal Shelter will no longer be a shelter. A shelter, by definition, is a haven. It is a place where suffering ends. <coughs> Unfortunately, when the animals will be going on for experiments and practice surgery, their suffering, both mental and physical, will not be ending. And it's a shame. It's, it's very unfortunate that people have worked for many years to turn a dog pound into an animal shelter and the actions of the Health Science Center have a very high potential of turning it back into just a dog pound. The appointments of people and the provision of dollars are helping create this excellent biomedical... The city has no option. The state law imposes upon the city the duty to deliver these animals on demand. If the statistics are correct and most voters are still undecided about Tuesday's primary, there are a lot of decisions to be made between now and then. With the elections this close, the watchful eye of the state is shifting from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Incumbent Governor George Nye is considered a shoe-in for the Democratic nomination. Nye, 55, could be the first man elected to two full terms as governor of the state. The McAllister native spent 24 years in state government before he was elected governor four years ago. 16 of those years were as lieutenant governor. The interest Tuesday, though, will be on the Republican fight for the governor's office. House Minority Leader Neil McCaleb and State Auditor and Inspector Tom Daxon are pitted against one another in a race that may have turned around in the last few weeks. The McCaleb campaign got off to a slow start this year with loose organization. The Edmund representative has been in the state house for eight years, and during his term as the minority leader, he has twice mobilized the Republicans and conservative Democrats to force additional tax cuts. His organization has picked up in the last few weeks of the campaign, and analysts say he is gaining ground on his major opponent, Tom Daxon. Daxon hit the trail early and used campaign techniques that helped him defeat a 20-year incumbent for state auditor in his first political try four years ago. As auditor, the CPA found $22 million undeposited dollars in a surprise cash audit of the State Treasurer Commission, and he has promoted better financial management. Another race that could be close Tuesday is the Democratic race for State Attorney General. Incumbent Janerate Cartwright is getting a hard run from Muskogee District Attorney Mike Turpin. Cartwright has had a varied political career. He has been an assistant U.S. attorney, a member of the State House, legal counsel for Governor David Boren, he was on the Corporation Commission, and four years ago he was elected as Attorney General. Cartwright has tried to put public trust on state tax rolls. He's fought foreign ownership of Oklahoma land and has fought out-of-control utility rates. His opponent in the primary, Mike Turpin, has been conducting an aggressive campaign across the state. He has been the Muskogee District Attorney for five years, and as president of the Oklahoma DA's Association, he was instrumental in the passage of the Victim's Bill of Rights. Those are only a few of the races on Tuesday's ballot. Some others are Lieutenant Governor, Corporation Commissioner, the Congressional seats, about half of the State House and Senate seats, and a couple of state questions. It's a busy election time. And if the undecided voters are going to swing the election like a couple of candidates hope they will, they haven't much time to make up their minds. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for the work that you did. It's what made this victory uh, possible. And I haven't seen the final results. Several people, uh, and our radio didn't work on the plane coming in, but several people... Uh, <laughs> I've been told we're ahead, so I hope that's true. <laughs> <laughs>